All right, I'm gonna do another one of these fun like uh, assessments and recommendations for sentencing and stuff, which is what I do for a living and kind of these like you know, extreme um, cases that I enjoyed studying and that I enjoyed working with. And I built my resume around working with, I, I took a little bit of a risk yesterday with my hair. I'm not ready to like unleash the beast with a, well, like <laughs> for summer or whatever. Um, embracing my inner blonde over here. Um, but, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do two clinical assessments. I'm going to talk about, and this, uh, I talk about this in detail in my third piece. It's called something like, uh, unpub not published yet, uh, through Fulton books or anything else. Um, harm reduction strategies and budget conscious approaches, criminal justice, uh, substance use disorder, mental health, something like that. Um, I'm going to do two, we're going to do patient A and patient B. Um, and they're going to be members of the military and they're going to be members of the military that came home. And it's not my intention to work, um, for the VFW. Um, if they wanted to contract me or do something like that, I, I could work with them or contract me out to do a questionnaire or something to help the person get help. If that's what they wanted, I could do that. But, um, we're going to do patient A and patient B, you know, people that served in the military and, um, and I'm going to try to keep it brief and concise, not an actual assessment. There's an example or a couple of examples of actual assessments on my website, www.americasfaveadvocate.org, like America's favorite SEAL team you can check it out. And we're going to have these two people be convicted of murder. We're going to talk about things like firearm safety and, and mental health, uh, and the difference between PTSD and trauma, um, and, um, kind of how that presents itself with maybe genetic uh you know precursors or genetic basically predisposition um to uh violence or hereditary you know agents of uh socialization um and and things like that with genetics which isn't what i do on a research team um i don't study things like genetics i don't really like to crunch numbers to that level of, of math and things like that um, I have a human services major and I, I like studying the social imagination theory and how it kind of affects the psyche. Um, but patient A um, is going to be someone on a special forces unit and patient B is going to be somebody that was drafted during uh, Vietnam and really wasn't thrilled about kind of going there. And uh, I think like for the hypothetical thought experiment, the draft will have occurred during Afghanistan and both patients will be kind of in their late 30s. So patient B was drafted into Afghanistan, even though I don't think that happened. And then patient A was on a special forces unit. Um, and then the question for the, the medical community, if they want to look at this type of genome, genome study and then pair it along with my psychological theories or analyses, um, is, is whether or not patient A had some type of genetic mutation or some type of, um, you know, thing with their RNA, DNA or whatever, um, that, um, you know, allowed some type of genetic mutation. Like a lot of times with substance use, you talk about uh, receptors when it comes to um, endorphins and how genetic mutations in the DNA can change genetic mutations in brain neurology and basically have those dopamine and stuff receptors be different or the, the, the whatever that release it or other inhibitors that allows you to feel better when you use things like cannabis because more of that type of and uh, um, oxytocin or dopamine or um, those types of endorphins and whatnot are released into the brain. Um, that's the general theory behind um, how uh, actual genetics affects um, substance use disorder um, and normally specific substances, um, you know, but uh, the R values are kind of whatever they use. They're kind of like non-conclusive in a lot of them. Um, and I find much more evidence with alcoholism specifically when it comes to things like fraternal and paternal twins and being separated at birth um, and kind of uh, father-son relationships and things like that with alcoholism. That's where the real kind of proof is. Um, and the question is, is it, is it society? Is it agents of socialization or is it the DNA, RNA and, and, and biophysiology? Um, so I think I'm going to maybe stop the video right now and then do the audio to take less, you know, space. And hopefully we can follow along, like run a little research team and we can have our physicians think about that. We could have our data analysis thinks about if we have seven or so, well, right now we have patient A and patient B. So we pulled data with those two patients, which probably isn't conclusive with any type of, uh, uh, qualitative study, but if we're doing a excuse, quantitative study, but if we're doing a qualitative study with two case studies, um, we can take a look at the concept that I talk about in my third piece of writing, uh, which a lot of which is mental health. I actually wrote it. I wrote it um, like Vermont, the Vermont State Constitution is written in, in a lot of the, the titles uh, subsequently. 
um, and independent clauses separated by commas with safety pads when I was housed in a, in a involuntary mental health treatment evaluation hold in jail <laughs> for 72 days on the peaceful protest I did in Montpelier. Like Ken Kesey, I, I've, I wrote that piece in the loony bin. <laughs> and then and then the security confiscated it because they thought I was going to hang myself with the string on the notebook. And I rewrote it the next day. But I'll come back and, and we'll, we'll take a look at this study. All right, so we have patient A and patient B. And patient A, we'll say, is a member of a special forces unit. And I think it's just better because there might be stigma or whatever favoritism that goes along with identifying as a certain branch or something like that. And then patient B will be someone who was drafted, hypothetically, into Afghanistan and wasn't really a willing participant in that type of um, war. Um, so, so you know, patient A is 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 what I'm going to say um, may have that genetic predisposition to violence in their family and be okay with it. And they might be okay with it for the right reasons, you know, and that's when someone like me has to assess, you know, what angers the person, what's their target of aggression, um, kind of what their morals are and stuff like that when coming down with, um, recommending sentencing for something like a self-defense case or an excusable defense or a homicide or, you know, murder three or involuntary manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter, any of that stuff that happens, you know, underneath premeditated murder. Um, which is something that I would take a hard look at the person's IQ and kind of history of kind of planning out that type of stuff, but um, just psychologically. Um, but then again, me on the team, I'm not a detective or a special agent. Um, and then patient B, um, you know, is going to say, you know, uh, have actual PTSD. So I'd say like, you know, they're exhibiting these symptoms psychologically. This is what I see with the patient's assessment. I'd like a referral to a clinical psychologist, or excuse me, a, a psychiatrist or um, and maybe even an APRN, if, if I can just get a diagnosis quickly and the patient wants some type of treatment, um, to, 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 to have them say, this is actually, um, you know, your DSM diagnosis, because technically in my position, I can bill for that with a DSM diagnosis, but I'm not licensed. So what I do is I make referrals and say, Hey, this is what I'd check out. And my, my pocket DSM is not what most psychiatrists would have. Um, so again, you know, patient, patient B, we're worried about PTSD. And patient A, you know, we might be worried about, you know, is this person a, a, a sociopathic person that doesn't feel bad after the fact? Or are they a psychopathic person that enjoys killing for the wrong reasons? Um, and basically what happens is, is patient um, A, you know, comes back um, and he's fine at first. And, you know, he's fine at first. He tells, you know, stories that the VFW or with his buds or whatever about how, you know, funny stuff that he, that he found overseas or whatever. Um, and he doesn't really seem to be negatively affected until, you know, he, you know people, people start judging him, people start calling him a killer. Um, you know, people are angry at what he did in Afghanistan because they didn't understand why we were there. People accuse him of wartime atrocities because of stuff that they read in the news. And then suddenly you see a guy who's a positive contributing member to society um, revert to drinking alcohol daily. And suddenly he becomes an alcoholic. And you wonder, like, hey, listen, like, why is this dude suffering from alcoholism? And then he loses his job and then his wife divorces him. Um, and then he's, he's at the VFW trying to seek some type of benefits or something. And you have to come up with a decision. Okay. Like, does this guy have PTSD from what he suffered in the war or, or, or does he have trauma? And if you read my first piece, American Psyche, I talk about trauma being rooted in social influence. So trauma is not a neurological brain change in my mind. Trauma is feeling judged because you can't be honest about something, which is what we've got essentially what psychotherapy is or talk therapy. Now, trauma is saying, like, I can't be honest about whatever, um, and now I feel judged because people, you know, will judge me if I'm honest about it. Or the person knows something about it, be it my drug use or anything else, and I feel like I can't be me with that kind of on my record. Um, and, and what happens is, is the person psychologically traumatized. So they feel like they can't be themselves. They can't talk about it. They feel they're judged for it. And what happens is the mind is psychologically traumatized and you're, you're just suffering. So there's many different kind of responses to trauma, or ways that people cope with it. Um, and that can be, you know, alcoholism to kind of cover up the mind, you know, fighting itself. It can be kind of like anger as a trauma response and outward aggression. Um, and, and if you start hurting people, then that's an issue too. You know, uh, there's lots of different ways that people kind of cope with trauma. Um, and one of those ways is that the mind actually fractures and you become almost schizoaffective. Um, and, and, and what happens is when you have a relapse into the traumatic event, like hearing a gunfire glass, glass shatter, 
your brain seeks, you know, to basically have that trauma, have that trauma response, have a coping mechanism. And the response isn't like, I need to duck and cover, I need to reload my AR, I need to call my friends so we can deal with this. Um, the response is my brain can't handle this. It was not designed for this. I don't have the bi- biology to cope with this. Um, you know, my, my brain synapses have essentially split or shattered like the person's first schizoaffective um, you know, split between 19 and 21. It normally happens or after a traumatic event like death in the family or loss of a loved one um, or divorce. Um, you know, that's what you see with schizoaffective. Um, but with PTSD, you know, when, my, when I, you know, hypothesize, theorize my, my opinions on psychology are, you know, when that same type of traumatic event happens in war, the mind can't handle it and it fractures. And what happens is suddenly, you know, you go into that hallucinogenic state where we're hallucinating, we're seeing things that aren't there, you know, and the mind is flooded with endorphins to soothe the brain. Here's your oxytocin, here's your serotonin, here's your dopamine. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You know, but the trauma response is different than having a fictitious woman in your life because you don't have that, you know, sexual romantic need met. You know, what it is, is it's a trauma response that could be, you know, considered like paranoid. There's two types of schizophrenia that you could associate with paranoid or something else where suddenly you're going to this fight or flight thing where you're worried that something's happening and you have to kind of deal with it. Um, That to me is really what actual PTSD is. And trauma is far less than that. But again, I'm a strong proponent on if you're making these kind of diagnoses, decide if the person actually needs services and get them the services no matter what it is. But you have to be careful because once you have a diagnosis on your record, it can it can do a lot of, of bad from me being able to represent myself in court, which is what I'm dealing with now, to be even be to be able to speak in the court a lot. Because like because I have a diagnosis from 15 years ago, I'm clinically trained better than most people in the country to case manage and advocate in the court a lot. I, I'm not even allowed to speak in the criminal proceedings right now. I was not even allowed to speak because I was, I'm alleging, improperly seized and, and held on a mental health evaluation hold. In the court of law, like very few people are more are better expert witnesses than it, when it comes to me with this type of stuff. And I was completely silenced because of a diagnosis from 15 years ago. So it's just something to consider. But if you can get the person's services, you know, it's something that you might want to think about. Um, when it comes to kind of, you know, allowing a person to get services and let an advocate like me advocate for those people with those diagnoses. Um, but if we kind of like reel, reel it back in, that's the difference between PTSD and trauma. And I'm, I'm saying that, you know, when patient A comes back, you know, he's fine with who he is until society starts judging him for what he did on Special Forces Union in Afghanistan. And then he reverts to alcoholism and then his alcoholism becomes unmanageable and he's frustrated because he lacks agency outside of the workplace. And then he loses his job because he's late because he's drinking because he loses his friends. And then he has no agency working, you know, it, uh, and then this is just trauma compounded. And then suddenly he's stuck at home with his wife and, and teenage daughter who, who hates him because she's just a teenager. And then suddenly his wife divorces him and he's at home and he has nothing but alcohol. You know, and it's all because basically how that person, how he was treated, how patient A was treated when they came back, you know, from, from Afghanistan. You know, so like the hypothetical situation that what we can think of is, is, is patient A, you know, is, is, is brought up on some type of death resulting, some type of murder charge where they're, they're in a dark alley and, then, and they're trying to defend themselves, right? And they end up ending the person's life. And they end up ending the person's life and, and the, the lawyer decides to take an affirmative defense of justifiable homicide and self-defense. Well, you know, before you get to that, do you want an excusable defense? Like the person clearly has PTSD after what they've been through, right? Well, I'm saying it's not an excusable defense. And and it's not an excusable defense because their trauma hasn't presented itself in symptoms severe enough to do things like hallucinate or have auditory hallucinations or have a you know increase in different endorphins or hormones or brain synapse change and stuff like that that go along kind of with PTSD. So that's the first half of the excusable defense. And then the second half of the excusable defense is actually right from wrong. You know, so does patient A know the difference from right from wrong? So when he, when he assaults the person, does he know that his deadly force, you know, that his use of force can result in deadly force? Probably. So there's no excusable defense for me when it comes to patient A because they're probably very intelligent. They probably took an exam. They know what their force can do, which is result in death, and their trauma is not PTSD. So basically, you know, there's no excusable defense. Is there a justifiable defense? You know, was it self-defense? And you could probably argue with patient Nate's training and, and level of kind of ability to defend himself or others and do things like, 
you know, hand holds or submission holds or kind of, you know, knowing how hard to strike someone to break bone or something like that in my martial arts school, you could probably argue that there's not much justifiable um, defense when it comes to basically a, a murder three charge. Um, what you could probably do is 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 convince the attorney's office um, to basically do some type of plea deal um, where patient A pleads out to some type of manslaughter charge, voluntary or involuntary. And I could probably get it down to involuntary, and you could probably get it down to involuntary because patient A didn't seek out the fight. Um, if he sought out the fight in the bar or something, then it might be voluntary manslaughter, especially if they walked outside the bar and decided to, to fight together, and then the victim ended up dying. So that that's, pa- that's patient A, and we looked at the difference between trauma and PTSD, we looked at how, you know, the P- treating people when they come home from war, to- from war can basically cause patient A a perfectly, you know, okay dude to, to, to spiral down into alcoholism and stuff like that. And it's another level if you want to add, you know, the alcohol usage on top of it. So there's no such thing as an excusable defense under um, diminished capacity for using alcohol if, 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 if you take it knowingly and willingly. So if the person's drinking and you didn't slip him, you know, a, a Mickey or something like a um, he doesn't have a, a an excusable defense, you know, but you know, what you could probably do is make a stronger case for basically the involuntary manslaughter if 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 patient A decided to go out, you know, like we talked about with a voluntary manslaughter charge, depending on his level of intoxication. Um and with other mitigating circumstances like the family and the trauma and everything like that, um, I would advocate pretty hard for him to get a um involuntary manslaughter charge and then it would take a lot of time and me to actually look at the person's assessment and talk about this stuff with the judge and the prosecutor and the defense attorney and hopefully chill with the patient for a year or so before we come up with a treatment plan or some type of reparative contract or some type of um, punitive sanction that could be as much as I don't know 10 or 15 years in prison probably. So patient B is the person that was hypothetically drafted for Afghanistan and they come home and, and, and they're just struggling, you know, so they come home, maybe they didn't even get through their four years, you know, maybe they got an honorable, honorable discharge or something, I'm not exactly sure how that works. Um, we could say that though, they got an honorable discharge and they ended up buying a firearm because they were looking over their shoulder every day. So someone with an honorable discharge, I believe that was not court-martialed, um, can still own firearms. If you have a a court martial on your record, um, and I'm not sure of the difference between dishonorable discharge and a court martial. Um, but if you're court martialed the way that the ATF laws read, you're a prohibited person. So patient B has been trained with deadly force, and the military can't trust him to use that deadly force overseas. So basically, ATF can't trust him to own a firearm here on home soil. That's the way that that works. Um, and it doesn't really matter what your diagnosis is or your process in that. But um, say that he got, he got you know honorably discharged, and then he comes back and he owns the firearm, which is what we're saying. And he has PTSD. PTSD is not technically a diagnosis which people would really want diminished capacity for when it comes to a excusable defense or any protective custody holds uh, subsequent to that or anything like that. But you know, PTSD is something that's difficult to get on disability benefits for, even if it's really negatively affecting your life, um, especially permanent disability, which is what they basically describe benefits as with the social security system. Um, so probably the outlet for the referral for that, if you were case managing, would be the VFW or something like that, especially if he was honorably discharged because of something like PTSD, wartime PTSD. Um, so he comes home and he's really struggling. He has the referral to VFW, has the referral to some type of healthcare provider that's allowing him medications and stuff like that. So the PTSD is exhibiting itself yet less and he owns a firearm. And, and what happens is he's just, he's suffering, 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 and he just can't talk about this stuff. You know, whenever he hears a loud noise, he starts hallucinating. You know, he's just not, not having fun. He's just, he's severe PTSD, you know, and, and what he does is just kind of like shut down. He can't handle it. He cries at night. He gets angry, you know, but it's just, it's less of a kind of aggression thing and more him just like being overwhelmed um, with the symptoms that exhibit when external stimuli, you know, causes his brain to, to basically relapse into that kind of traumatic state. So what he does is he, he talks to a, a specialist who does ecstasy therapy. And the person puts him on some type of MDMA that's, you know, regulated or whatever. And he takes MDMA and he does talk therapy. And what MDMA is, is, is rather than when they see the trauma response kind of going into that fight or flight and having all that adrenaline, all that cortisol, you know, all that we need to get out of here or whatever, you know, which is a trauma response to 
the the type of you know event that caused his mind to fracture him to have PTSD. The ecstasy causes the release of those good endorphins, like we were talking about with basically a schizoaffective romantic delusional or something like that. So the ecstasy is soothing the brain, telling the brain like like a mother or like a wife or something, you're okay, like you're going to be okay, man. You're going to get through this. Um, so he can sit there and then the talk therapist can talk about things like, you know, witnessing wartime atrocities or watching his friend die. And he can talk about that type of stuff without his brain going into that flight or flight response because it's, you know, even in a controlled talk therapy setting, it's being, you know, soothed to basically like understand like, hey, listen, you know, your brain is okay, you know, even though it's, it's, it's fractured and it wants to go back into that flight or flight scenario. And then further down the line, I talk about this in my second piece of writing, um, conceptually, and I don't, I don't do this type of therapy. Um, and that's called Clinical Applications of American Psyche. That should be available in at least a year or two, um, you know, once kind of I get done with advocating here in Vermont. Um, and uh, once probably my second edition comes out of American Psyche, and I'll happily autograph that for you as long as you take some time to listen to what people go through in prison. Um, that's available online, um, Amazon through Fulton Books. Um, but kind of, you know, the ecstasy can be used, you know, to recondition their mind and, and, and it's behavioralism, it's, it's, it's operant reconditioning. And I talk about reconditioning in that piece as well, not just using things like uh, ecstasy and, and trauma response and stuff like that, um, to basically allow the, the person to experience things like shattering glass. And, and Bandura did something, no, it wasn't, it was, it was Watson. Watson did something similar to this where he condition people to be scared of loud noises and it's deemed unethical by the research board um you can't do that stuff you can't especially do that stuff with kids that can't consent to it um you know but you could use the mdma to have the person you know in a controlled setting with someone they trust over years you know kind of confront these fears of, of the stuff like that and then you could see kind of if he could get through it um i've done similar stuff you know with myself and talked about it with other people through um, now I'm, I'm fine with the, the, the flavor of alcohol. I actually enjoy hop, hoppy honey. I enjoy alcohol and things like my salads and, and cooking wine. Um, I enjoy the smell of cannabis. I enjoy the smell of, um, uh, what's this stuff called? Not, not the marijuana, but the hemp, uh, hemp, um, hair dye and stuff that my ex-girlfriend used to wear. Um, and that's just the way I've reconditioned my mind to not have that response of, you know, this is a substance and I want to use it or not. This is a substance and I really don't want to use it to just like, hey, actually, I like the smell of, of the opium poppy. I do, you know, but I don't like how I feel with those toxins inside me. So I'm not going to use it. Um, but, you know, that that's how the person could use MDMA therapy to work on their kind of PTSD. But kind of while this is happening, the person owns a gun and they're not prohibited and they're not prohibited, you know, with mental health because PTSD isn't a serious diagnosis and they're not in or non hospitalization or in a psychiatric facility or something like that that ATF prohibits. And it will just be in we'll be in La La Land where there's like a state <laughs> with only federal rights. <laughs> and then like um, so the, the patient B, you know, has a firearm and he, he keeps it in his glove box. He's trying to be safe about it. But all of a sudden, you know, it happens is PTS, TTPST goes off and he's having an episode and he feels threatened and he pulls out his gun and he shoots somebody. So first of all, like, is it is it a justifiable defense? Is it self-defense? Well, you have to look at the victim. Did the victim actually threaten the person? How do you define threat? Which is something I'm going through the state of Vermont right now. Like, I'm a gun safety advocate. Like, if I have every person and their uncle saying they feel threatened because I like asked them to do something nicely, you know, before like I have to respond because I think they might be violent, and then suddenly I'm being called threatening. Um, yeah. You know, this is justifiable homicide in Vermont. If you feel threatened, you have the right to end people's life as a gun owner. So it's like, this is an issue that needs to be addressed with firearm safety beyond any other garbage that's gone on the last four years, is feeling threatened, having a justifiable uh, defense for murder. Um, that's the way that our statute reads for murder in Vermont, and it's 30 years or more um, in prison. You know, so, so, so he's feeling threatened, whatever, he's exhibiting symptoms of PTSD and he shoots the person. So should there be a justifiable offense? Well, if you look at the victim and the victim doesn't have a gun, the victim really wasn't doing anything for other witnesses and stuff like that, then no, like you don't have a justifiable defense. You didn't really feel threatened. So when you look at PTSD, do we have an excusable defense? Probably. We probably have an excusable defense for murder. So if you want to say, hey, listen, this person needs treatment, like it's not okay that the person have a firearm right now, it'd be nice if we have some type of, you know, felony on his record to restrict access to firearms, at least for now with even a deferred sentencing, you know, what should we charge the person with if they're exhibiting symptoms of PTSD? 
So that's a mitigating factor, and that's something that I could recommend um, to basically have the person not be convicted of, you know, involuntary manslaughter even, because involuntary manslaughter probably carries a, a statutory range of something like, I don't know, five to ten years. Probably at least three. So you can think about that. You could think about what you could, you could charge the person with with those mitigating circumstances. Or if the, 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 if the prosecution is hell-bent on charging him with, you know, voluntary manslaughter because you brought a gun to the bar or whatever, you know, or an involuntary manslaughter charge, you, you had the gun, it was unsafely stored, you know, it shouldn't be doing that type of thing, he was going through therapy and stuff like that. You know, what can you use as a, as a as, and this is a mental health thing, what can you use as a justifiable defense? So it's an excusable defense. What can you use as an excusable defense, you know, for the person's mental health? Well, he was exhibiting symptoms of PTSD, and did he know right from wrong? Probably, but the symptoms of his mental illness, what? Made it so he could not determine what a threat was or wasn't. You know, so at the time, he didn't know the difference from right from, from right from wrong when it comes to involuntary manslaughter because he didn't think, he thought the person was actually a threat. So, I mean, this is a difficult scenario, especially with someone that served his country. What really I would recommend for this is some type of reparative panel where the victim's family comes in and, and then works with kind of the um, the veteran or the alleged kind of offender or person that committed the act in this scenario to come up with kind of a way to deal with this in a restorative setting. Um, and I'd recommend that after working with the person for a few years and kind of like dealing with like, hey, yeah, man. You got charged with basically murder, um, and everybody knows, and, and not many people are on your side right now. We kind of have to earn the respect of the public back before the family is willing to talk to you. So we need to get your lawyer to kind of ask for some continuances and get the judge to get to know you a little bit better. You should probably continue your treatment. Um, if the ecstasy stuff is working for you, it can, but, you know, that's not necessarily a proven you know, method for addressing this type of um, you know PTSD, and you might want to think about that now that kind of you're on trial here. Um, that that's a little um hats off to kind of military service and stuff like that um and hopefully you know you guys are realizing that you know uh you can't believe everything you read in the paper and the way the media you know portrays my clients makes my job dramatically harder which is helping people rehabilitate themselves in the community um the way the media portrayed portrayed my peaceful protest and you know I, I didn't make a mistake. I did I did a conscious decision to do a protest to enact social change to bring awareness to the need for two parties and, and what the Second Amendment is and isn't, but primarily why unnecessary violations of conditions are released and a lack of crisis beds result in something like over a quarter of the Vermont State Prison population or 400 inmates being housed, us uh, spending uh, probably around $200 million that we don't have to, which we could help people with, and we might have to go to war with China over... Um, and then finally, something like 30, 40, or even more fatal overdoses every year. Um, and it's all because basically people didn't take the time to get to know me and who I am and who I'm not before they rushed to judge me as someone who was violent, threatening. Um, I've not, I'm not like that at all. Anybody that you talk to me that knows me would say, that, that, that's a bunch of malarkey. It couldn't be farther from the truth.